Back into Tom's Brain, episode two of the Thomas McNabb podcast. I was just doing my vocal warm up exercises. I did them in front of another person yesterday, somebody that I'm interviewing, or who is actually more precisely interviewing me for the podcast. I did them in front of her yesterday, and it it was it was quite amusing. But you need to do them. I I need to do them. I can't just launch into talking like this. I need to make sure that I've formed my mouth properly for all the consonants and vowels, especially given how I felt yesterday. My entire lower jaw felt more, my entire lower face, my entire face felt like it was on fire. And I don't know what was causing it. Every, whenever I feel afflicted, I just chalk it down to the fact that it's time to go for new blood. Every two weeks, I go to the hospital for a blood transfusion. It, it hasn't been like this all my life. It started when I was about three years old. I got really ill after a holiday to Butlins. If you don't know what Butlins is, it's kind of like um camp. Gosh, that's really the only description I can think of it. Camp camp in all sense of the word, except you stay in chalets, not tents. So, this was a holiday for the family, me, my dad, my mum and my sister. So my mum and dad had been living with, dealing with my condition for about two years. And they were really brave <laughs> in the fact that they didn't let my condition affect the way they were going to live. They brought up me and my sister, they treated us exactly the same. So this holiday came around and we went. But it was just a bit too much sunlight exposure for my body. You know, they knew to cover me up. I wore a coat, I wore a hat. But it was just a summer holiday and it was too much so my body when it, it gets too much sun it's almost like getting a cold I, I think somebody said it's like when you get heat stroke or sunstroke oh this happens to me just for the smallest amount of, of sun exposure. So they took me to the hospital when I got back and this was like my first reaction. So I, I, I remember being put into quarantine because they had to kind of assess the situation. It's such a rare illness. Nobody really knew what they were dealing with. So I was in quarantine to be on the safe side. This was the 80s, barely coming up to 1990. And it's just, it's a different, I say it's a different time. Doctors are still as ignorant as they are, as they were. It's an unfortunate circumstance, but at least they know now that any babies that are born with my condition 
you you test and test for a bone marrow transplant donor as soon as possible for the best chances of living a normal life. I had my bone marrow transplant at 13 years old. So needless to say, it didn't work. It didn't take, even though it was from my sister. We are just too different. She's supposed to be the best match, but it just didn't take. My body refused it. But hey ho, here we are. Back to what I was saying about my first ever transfusion. The process of thought is, since all the blood cells in my own body are faulty, and they have a faulty gene, making them allergic to the sun. These cells need to be replaced with donor cells, a blood transfusion. So that's what I had when I was three years old. And it's just two bags of blood, maybe three. And they give it over six or eight hours. And that's it. So I had one at three, and then I think to be on the safe side I had one six weeks later, and then I had another one six weeks later, and the pattern began every six weeks, up until a point where they were monitoring my blood count. A person's blood count is usually around 14. I don't know what that 14 stands for, but that's a regular person's blood count. Mine is lucky to be at 10. So I operate on a 10, and if it goes anywhere below 7, that's the ideal time to transfuse. So, my doctor noticed it was going low sooner than four week, uh, sooner than six weeks. So they changed the transfusions to every four weeks, and then that became every three weeks, and then that became now as it is every two weeks. But that's also a fact of that being. I'm operating inside an adult body now. I got an upgrade a, f a few years ago, and I am inside an adult body now. So, I get transfused much sooner because I can't function on anything under eight. You know, back when I was a kid, I could function on a on a six. I could function on a six blood count. That's less than half of what a recommended person should have. Re that's a recommended person. It just occurred to me that in the first episode, or well, in the introduction, the introduction, by the way, if you've subscribed to this podcast and you listen to this, to this episode. You um, might not have noticed that there is a secret bonus episode, which is a short introduction. It didn't show up in the first, in the first, like, I thought it hadn't shown up. But if you press subscribe on that first episode, and then you go to add old episodes, it will magically appear as episode zero. And I just love that idea of it being kind of hidden and secret. I've always been attracted to the idea of mystery and hidden secrets. Like, 
I knew very early on my favorite time of the year was Halloween because it's just so different. You get to pretend to be something else and you can kind of make a scary story up and that's what I loved doing so I, I did it all year round and I made up my own scary stories and my own stories of mystery and intrigue and spooky ghosts, haunted cameras and stuff like that. I remember when I was 10, my primary school teacher brought in this box, this wooden casket that had intricate carvings on it and it was locked so he used it the to tell to assign the class a story writing assignment i took this and ran with it and when i say i ran with it i wrote this story about a boy moving into a new house and finding the box in his attic and then the former owner of the house is chasing him down to get the box back and he still doesn't know what's inside it. It's, it's all very mysterious. You know how last episode I gave you a little insight into my writing history with that rat. Well, I thought I'd delve into my writing again and I put the story that I wrote about the box and I'm going to read it word for word as I wrote it when I was 10. Well actually, this is a rewrite because the original copy was in my school book that I handed in to my teacher so I never actually had the original copy. So I had to rewrite it from memory and I've got this feeling that the original was well, I, I've got the feeling that the, the original is much better than what I've got written down in front of me because I don't have the original. I do have this copy and and this copy is just derivative of what a 10 year old like me came up with. It's just basically ideas. They're not very well fleshed out. It, it's very uh, insulting to call them stories, short stories. They are just more like short ideas. But anyway. This is The Secret Box. David had just moved into his new house, and of course, there was a lot of work to do. David was helping his dad putting boxes in the loft when he noticed a glint in the corner, so he went over there to see what it was. When he got down, he phoned his friend Emma to come over. When she came, David showed her the box. They tried to open it, but they couldn't, mainly because it had a lock. Look, said David. A word, Lexand. Maybe it's a name. Hearing a knock at the door, David went downstairs. It was a man. He said, Hello, I used to live here, and I had a box with the word Lexand on it. No, 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 uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> when David returned, Emma wasn't there. He went upstairs in the loft to see if she was up there. As he went in, he saw a glint. It was the key. So they went down to try it. It fit. David fell off his bed in excitement. Uh-oh. What do you mean, uh-oh? There's an anagram. Well, what does it say? Og ot het tritkek dante. Third. Leeds. Redupk nad. Reet sai. E Odu Cocknilu Tidna Loloft et Tpa. 
David didn't ever try to figure out the puzzle. I've done it! What? Go to the kitchen and the third slide cupboard and there is a door. Unlock it and follow the path. Yes! David said, falling off his bed again. The next day, Emma wasted no time. Whoa! Wee! They went down a slide to a door. Well, open it. Oh no! An anagram! Well, at least it's shorter. What does it say? Chiqua to offer te prats. Oh, that's easy. Watch out for the prats. No, it's watch out for the traps. As they fell, David flew his arms up, knocking something down with them. It was a box, and it contained... <laughs> a 50 million pound ring. They sold it and got 750 million pounds because they actually found out it was worth more. When they were in the library, they found a history book saying that a box containing a ring worth lots of money and the man it had belonged to died. And he left his box in the loft, and he stares around the house asking if anyone had seen his box. So, money solves everything. That's basically the moral of the story. So I love the idea of mystery. And it's very coincidental that my own podcast, unbeknownst to the way that I set it up, Episode zero kind of appears mysteriously in your feed. So in that episode, I said, I wouldn't have this podcast be so medical. I would slowly introduce the idea of my medical treatment through humor. And I think I'm failing. It got a bit too clinical did that story but yeah went from butlins to bone marrow transplant it's not a good segue so i apologize but there's no real way of getting around explaining the fact that my blood cells need regeneration. And the way to do that is via a blood transfusion. I could go on to talk about a whole host of topics based on that. One that I'm, I always want to be really passionate about ever since coming out is the fact that there is a ban on gay men donating blood. However, if you have abstained from sex for a year, then somehow that makes your blood suitable for donation. Don't know what that means. We all know what that means. Come on, let's just be honest. The gays have the AIDS. We don't want the AIDS to get in the blood. We don't want the NHS to be held responsible for infecting someone with HIV through a blood transfusion, which has only ever happened twice. You know, you'd think we would have moved on from times like that and ideas that infection... <laughs> it, it, anyway. I could talk about that, but I'm not going to because it makes me angry. What I am going to talk about is the method through which my body gets the blood. Up until I was 12, 
this method would be the tried and tested true treatment of Dom Stucker's telepathic tendencies to talk with T's and take the top off. Depends. Sorry. <laughs> there just was a lot of T's in that conversation and I noticed the spikes kept going up every time I went to so, as I was saying, the tried and true method of infusing blood is through a cannula via a needle in the vein. The veins that were best used for kids are in the hands. Unfortunately, my hands were exposed to sunlight a lot and had scarring and blisters and took a long time to heal and I don't know whose idea who, I don't know I was I only ever did what I was told but if I had my own voice back then I would have maybe gone whoa 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 wait my hands are recovering from damage to the sunlight and you want to put a needle in me? No. There is the option of finding a vein in the what is that part of the body that's like the elbow pit? You know how your armpit is the reverse side of your shoulder well what is that part of your body that's the reverse of your elbow is it the elbow pit that's what i'm gonna call it so there is the option of finding the best veins there but mine are very thin um so very rarely do transfusions have a success right because there's this thing of veins collapsing which sounds terrifying but it it just means it just bruises and it doesn't work so that's tends to what happen if they go in the elbow pit so for the first years of my life the Transfusions were through needles in my hands. I would always request to keep my writing hand free. I used to do a lot of writing. I, I just mentioned the fact that I wrote scary stories. I would do a lot of writing whilst waiting for my body to get new blood because. You, you were attached to this drip stand and there wasn't really much option to do anything else. You know, this was 1990. It wasn't a, a few years until they conned on to the idea that maybe children would enjoy um, a Nintendo or a Sega. Which, thankfully, at one point they figured that out. And that was good. But until then, I just had to keep myself occupied. There was TV, obviously. I enjoyed Blockbusters and Countdown and all those game shows. 15 to 1. And, oh yes, I stayed overnight on a Thursday for my transfusion. And on a Thursday night on Channel 4, there was a little-known program called The Crystal Maze. I used to love The Crystal Maze. I don't know why I'm saying I used to. I still love The Crystal Maze. It just makes me... I've got this connection of my staying overnight for my transfusion and watching The Crystal Maze because it was on on a Thursday night. 
and uh, I just dreamed of being on one of those kids special. I don't know how that would have worked, but maybe before they did. Uh, <sighs> the Crystal Maze was a game show. It, the, some this the the idea of the game show is this insane person played by Richard O'Brien from famed from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I would assume most of you know him from that. Um, and no, he, he has a, he has access to these far parts of lands, and he builds games in them to test people's abilities. You either had pure physical challenges or pure mental challenges, where you had to use your brain, and then mystery, and the other one, which I'm drawing a blank on. You had to use the a mixture of both your brain and your body to solve the puzzle in the required amount of time and get a crystal and the more crystals you have the more time you get at the end of the game inside the crystal dome and the crystal dome was this hollowed out crystal which you would climb inside and fans would blow and tokens would fly all around and you had to jump up and grab these tokens gold tokens if you grabbed any silver tokens they would be deducted from your amount and you wouldn't get the special super duper prize which i always remember the fact that there was one prize one person won the prize and i think he died whilst on his expedition to wherever it was he was sent which so they actually had to put in memoriam of this person that was kind of that was that's always stuck with me isn't that cheerful so yeah my transfusions and crystal maze will always be linked and the crystal maze will always have a special place in my heart for keeping me sane whilst all this truly horrible stuff was happening to my body to me it was just life yeah so when I got to 12 years old I changed my doctor and this doctor was going to prepare me for the bone marrow transplant and to do that they inserted an access line into my chest so that was the plan have the bone marrow transplant the bone marrow transplant would work the line would be removed and i would live a normal, normal life. But the transplant didn't work. And so I kept the line in. For about. Three and a half years. And these lines are designed to be kept for six months, ideally. So at three and a half years. I contracted an infection which got into my blood and I needed to have the line removed obviously and to recover for a good three and a half weeks because I also contracted pneumonia the best course of action after that was to put in another line because I needed the transfusion still. So they fitted another line. Less than two years later, this line fell out of my body. There is no way around it. One day, 
almost cleaning the site area where it came through the chest. There is a certain point at which it should not be passed. Like it has, there's parts which should be on the outside and parts which should be on the inside. Part of what should have been on the inside came on the outside. Oh crap. Now, you would think, okay, so let's just take that out and we'll explore what to do next. Somebody thought, I don't know who it was, but somebody thought that that wasn't the preferred thing to do. Somebody thought that they should just wrap up the line that was poking out of my body, almost falling out, and send me on my merry way. And by sending me on my merry way, that literally meant sending me back home and telling me, yes, I can go on holiday. I was due to go on holiday to another Camp Butlins type place. Needless to say, one night there, being wrapped up like a mummy, they caught somebody call me back in. Somebody saw the error of their ways and call me back in, and the line was removed. And by removed, I just meant somebody pulled on it like pulling a piece of string because it just fell out of my body. There was a small gap before I had my next line fitted. And during that time, I went swimming for the first time since I was 12. Because you cannot go swimming. You cannot submerge yourself in water with a Hickman line. Not as... I love swimming. I don't know what it is, but it's just like a great... It makes my body feel great. I think it's a great exfoliant for my skin. Because my skin's not the toughest. So the gentle um the gentleness of, of war you would you would think some, some people are affected by chlorine. Nothing like that bothers me too much at all really. I think it's just the right consistency to exfoliate my skin. That sounds really gross, actually, to think that I'm shedding all these dead skin cells in, peop in people's way who are trying to enjoy swimming. But whatever, I paid to use it. People have done a lot worse in swimming pools, I should imagine. So at 18, I had my third Hickman line fitted. Cut to... As they say in Hollywood, cut to nine years later, almost ten, I made the choice after having a few tears and repairs on this Hickman line that had survived. This Hickman line that is made for six months had survived nine years. I made the decision to not come to that point that happened the first time where I get an infection. I made the decision to get it removed from my body. Because it's been nine years. And there is an alternative now that is... <laughs> it's become fashionable. Fashionable for people who need intravenous treatment. It's called a porticath and it sits under the skin. So there's no wires on the outside. Which means I can go swimming. Which means I have started swimming again. For the first time in almost 10 years. 
I'm loving that. I really am. I can't describe it. It just feels... It just opens up my lungs a lot. And I think that comes back to not talking enough, not getting the right conversational skills. Going swimming really opens up my lungs. You know, you can kind of sound now how nasally and closed my lungs are because I've just woken up. Because as I was saying, I felt shocking yesterday. My face was on fire, my jaw hurt, my back hurt. And my theory is that this all happens because the cells that are in my body are worn out and I need new cells. My body's coming to depend on that pattern. And when time draws near, it kind of says, kind of reminds me, it's worried that I'm, I might be go, trying to go a bit longer and it's saying, hold on, you can't go any further. You need new blood, otherwise I'm going to stop working. These legs you enjoy using, forget about it. Eyesight, forget about it. I need new blood. Give me it now. So that's what happened. So yesterday I had my transfusion and I reconnected with a person who's been in my life for five years. And she interviewed me for the podcast. And hopefully you'll hear that next week. If not, the week after. So it may be that at, one, at some point, I stopped being weekly. Because I will record an episode every two weeks at least. But for the foreseeable future, I want to build up as many as I can. And using time which I wouldn't have otherwise thought to have used before. The time which I'm using to record this is the time when nobody is in the house, when my mum is walking the dog and my stepdad works through the day. So I'm alone in the house. It's a perfect opportunity to not have to worry about anything. I am not only cocooned in my bed, I'm cocooned in my house. It's just me and a microphone talking about nothing really. This, this has been a real nothing episode, like it started out as me wanting to tell you how shocking I felt yesterday and why that might make me sound a bit groggy because literally last night I went to sleep and I thought I was getting ill but it just it was just the way my body was feeling having needed blood and since I got the blood and I got a good night's sleep my body feels back to normal or back to my version of normal this version of normal which I operate on is would like I always think of a freaky Friday moment if somebody was to be inside my body I imagine they would be terrified of how much pain they were in but for me because I've lived with it it's just like a resonance there's always this resonance this low level of pain that I deal with that just doesn't register anymore because I've lived with it so I've been operating like that for the past four days got scary yesterday with my face on fire and my back wanting couldn't keep my body held up whilst walking 
I'd really like to take today to just relax. Get some of my podcast details more, more finally sorted out. But I think everything's going well. I'm so surprised how easy it was. Like, I really thought I'd run, I would run into a wall that I wouldn't be able to jump and I would need to ask somebody's help. But I sorted it all out by myself. And I'm so, it took me back to my days of web hosting and webmastering. I used to run a, a marginally successful British website for an American actress, which we shall go into another episode. I cannot get into that right now because, oh my god, the kind of worms that will open. But let's just say that was a time of my life. And going back into this podcast, I had to look at code, RSS, XML, and it, it was just like a throwback. I haven't done that in a long while, and thankfully, they make it easy. But not easy enough that it didn't require some brain power, which luckily, Tom's brain is powerful. Is that it? Is that how we're going to end? I can't think of anything else that I need to say. We've been talking for 45 minutes. I need to come up with a better sign-off. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. If you want to contact me, it's Tom's Brain 2, the number 2, at yahoo.co.uk. That's the best way to contact me. I do have lots of other email addresses, but... I mean, let's be... Who emails these days? You're going to do it on Twitter. And on Twitter, I am LGB Tom. That's the best way to contact me because it's easy to remember. L G B Tom. T O M. My name. The first part of Tom's brain. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this. It has been a different kind of episode. And these episodes are going to be quite mixed. You know, the first episode was me trying to get my head around talking. This episode, I haven't had any second guessing. I, I didn't second guess myself at all. I just talked. It was really freeing. Uh, I'm dreading, I'm almost dreading when I do my first interview. Because the sound quality isn't the best. And I'm worried if you're going to hate it. But whatever. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me. This is I call it this this is my therapy. It's cheap and affordable. For the for the time being. And who knows what will come from it. Hopefully it will bring me closer to some of you listeners. But that requires you to get in contact. Don't hide behind your iPod. Your iPhone listening to this. Get in contact with me. I do appreciate it. Even if, it's to, even, if it's, even if it's to say. You're terrible. You're a horrible person. Talking about needles and stuff. How dare you. I was enjoying my breakfast. And I have to hear the word blood. How dare you. Anyway my dog's home now. So I should probably wrap up this podcast. I am Thomas McNabb. And you have been listening to Tom's Brain.